Good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is another Two Tokens podcast. And today we're here in The Hague at the expert session with, on my left, for you on your right, Kai from Riddle and & Code and Leon Gerard from Sunified. Hi, Thanks, guys. Alex. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. Hi. You know, it's a short introduction. The people that listen to this podcast probably already know us. But let me start with Kai because he came the furthest from all the way from Austria. That's so kind. Thanks, yeah, thanks, yeah, Alex. Yeah. Good to see you again. Yeah. And good to be here in Den Haag. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, maybe just a short intro uh, for people don't know, who don't know me. I am the Chief Product Officer of Riddle & Code. We are a software hardware development company based in Austria, working internationally. And uh, we are specialized in creating the data infrastructure uh, of the new energy grid. So um, really making it possible to interconnect the machines um, that provide the clean energy and that use the clean energy of the future. Really happy to be here and, and talk about what we are doing and, and what we're going to do in the future. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say that Riddle & Code is on the forefront, right? You guys are ahead of the, of, of the crowd when it comes to tokenization of energy. And if you look at your founder, founder Tom, and what he's been writing, very interesting, very glad to have you here. Thanks, thanks a lot. Leon, you're also on the forefront. Yeah, we've been on the forefront for a little while. Um, Sunified really creates a, a type of trust anchor or crypto anchor. We're really focused on solar and then later on uh, storage, put our trust anchors into infrastructure right at the factory level. So we're not retrofitting solar panels. We're really looking to put uh, a concept of a trust anchor directly into the solar panel and providing uh, a programmatic way to, to um, compose uh, solar assets, the offtakes from solar assets, and the journey that we've been on with two tokens. Last year, we did uh, the tokenization of the asset. Now we're looking at tokenization of the offtake, the energy, the carbon credits, and what does that mean? Uh, and I think later today, we'll talk about how to make energy programmable. And so that's why we're here today. A little bit of reflection back with Kai and what Riddle & Code is doing and where Sunified is positioned as well. Great, because let's look at this. You know, the journey has been two and a half years, two and a half years when we started this working group. Of course, for Riddle & Code, the journey started in 2016, I think, right? That's uh, correct, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it's it, the, and the journey is still going, right? Everything what's happening around sure. us. Sometimes it's like a really interesting Hollywood movie, right? With the uh, energy crisis and the war in, in Ukraine and, and the digitization, everything is coming together. Oh, yes. And um, in fact, at the, uh, show in Paris, the Enlit show in Paris, it's about digitization, decarbonization, decentralization, oh, it's the fourth D, I forget, but all four are important and we play in all four, yeah. right? Yeah. So what was the focus on in phase one? Who wants to take that? Um, I, 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 might, I might take this one uh, because I think uh, it very much, much matched um, with the perspective that we have on the markets and that, that's why we liked it so much to, to, to join you guys. Um, it's about citizen participation, right? It's if, if you think about how do you unlock this capacity, you know, at the edge of the grid. Democratization, that was the fourth. Democratization, I was there thinking that, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. and that's what it's all about, right? Yes. So citizen participation, people don't care really about energy, but they start caring about things they own, right? And so we wanted to give them some ownership of energy assets, make them energy entrepreneurs themselves. And we did this as a product with my power for Riddle & Co, but also within the working group by tokenizing uh, larger assets and selling the tokens in very nice, efficient, fully online and digitalized um, uh, web processes to the crowd, right? Buy a token and you receive your energy. And the beauty here is you did that together with a DSO with Green Energy. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an energy provider, yeah. It's part of a, of a larger utility. Uh, it's not the TSO, though, but, but, but no worries. Um, that's what we want to actually get, get engaged with, right? It's also about the, the grid operators on the distribution side, but also on the transition side in the future. Mm. And how did Sunify play a role? Because you can tokenize a solar asset and the ownership, but why do you need Sunify? It's because you're doing this down under in Australia? or down? We, we got started early uh, 2017 down under. Uh, we started with uh, building our first kind of embodiment of a sensor. Uh, the price point w wasn't really there, so we had to really continue to build and wait for Moore's Law kind of to, uh, to help us. 
as you know, with Tom, um, there's there's now new chipsets available, and we're really Co to have harnessed some some of those. And Sunified is making a dedicated one for solar. So we we really got started uh, in Australia. Solar is really uh, the business case around solar is really uh, mighty in Australia. Yes. Lots of sun. Yes. Uh, very cheap land to build solar in Netherlands. Here we're kind of land constrained. So the the cookie cutter to to build solar at scale was really uh, something we wanted to expose. And then we're really facing grid scale solar to drive the unit economics of our sensor. It's kind of uh, complementary to what we're trying to do with democratizing solar. Uh, we still need to drive the industry ecosystem, and we really want to bring the sensor v uh, value frame in, into the eventual right, residential Right, so, so, the, so the first phase was tokenizing the asset, yeah. and uh, you did it with your own hardware uh, uh, solution. But we found in phase one that you don't always need a, a, a crypto or trust anchor to tokenize the asset, yeah, right? So, so a, a gateway approach was an early entry for that. And we also found that um, you know retrofitting existing solar parks, you know, with uh, additional uh, trust anchors is not a business case that'll work. But in the end, you know, projects are being launched. We're doing, you know, you're doing several projects in Austria, you know. Uh, Yep. Our other partner, Asset Blocks, is launching projects in Germany. Uh, we're doing a project here at Ameland. We did a proof of concept with the Green mm -hmm. Village. Yeah. So, but it's safe to say that phase one, tokenizing the asset, we're there. We know how to do it. It's not so much a technology that prevents us from holding it out. It's more the legal regulatory and, and, uh, and, and, and getting the business case sound. But now we're going to phase two which I think yes. is so much more yes. interesting, right? Yes. That's why we're here to kick off phase two for the Energy Token Working Group for the next year. Uh, you, you both are very much involved, but phase two is all about tokenizing the kilowatt hour. That sounds very techy, very nerdy. What does the average citizen buy for a tokenizing the kilowatt hour? What's the application? Yeah, well, Alex, so it's not black and white, right? So. Yeah, there's phase one and phase two, but there's actually an organic transition from one to the other, right? So you did have a tokenized um, asset that produces energy. And then obviously it, the first question thereafter is like, how do I get this energy and how do I get the value out of this asset? And that's where the tokenization of the very kilowatt hour comes in place as well. And um, it's, um, this, is, this is obviously a little bit of a more complex journey, but it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And, um, whereas the first phase was quite quick because you had like this one to end um, um, relation between one asset to many, many customers. Now you actually, you want to um, get into like every house if you want, right? So re um, it's, it's about when do you consume a kilowatt hour? And I'm, I'm a big, big friend of not building extremely virtual kind of solutions where there's actually no connection anymore between the production and consumption of the kilowatt hour, but we want actually, you know, to to also support sustainable consumption of, of energy. So we want to add now the um, the smart meters on the demand side to this whole game, right? So we can basically, um, you know, trace uh, both the production and the consumption in terms of yeah. you know temporal uh, um, correlation in terms of geographical correlation. And that's how it works, actually, right? It's a new way to buy energy. Um, so yeah. it means that I have my Tesla here in The Hague, mm -hmm. and I want to buy the next charge from my solar panel that is somewhere in Vienna. Absol and, absolutely. And then you would, I would just buy those using you know kilowatt hour tokens and load them in. That's the ultimate application. What we're doing is actually we're building new marketplaces, yes. right? On the medium to low voltage level. And by digitalizing the whole process, making it very easy to follow. And obviously, I mean, how exactly how this has been done, you know, maybe not be the most efficient thing to transport Dutch solar power to, to, the, to Austria. But as we, we were going to start having these marketplaces, we can be much more creative and do like some activities that wholesale traders are already doing now, like swaps, for example, right? So you could swap your energy with somebody sitting in Austria. So it's not, yeah, of course, you're not really buying not the physical the electron. electron. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah, you're just, you're, you're, you're buying the right to the electron. That's what you're doing, right? 
Absolutely. And so, uh, so we, and that needs to be. So it's a transaction from one synthetic to another. We're yes. not dealing with physical um, copper. Uh, however, we are measuring what is the actual flow and the value exchange uh, from one node to another on a distributed network. And the real marketplace is going from a centralized control marketplace where we have a pool price for energy to be a more distributed network where we have hyper-local pricing on electrons, maybe for a gated community with their own solar and a bunch of Teslas that could plug into that. And this network is then a distributed marketplace. And we, we do not have this sort of uh, constraint of having a centralized pool price if we can agree uh, amongst the community that we're going to have free energy <laughs> when it's really sunny and uh, everyone can, can enjoy the, 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 the kind of advantage of, of that. So even in the UK, you'll, you'll notice that there's some tariffs that basically they said there's so much abundant energy now uh, we're going to not charge for uh, solar from 3 to uh, 5 p.m. on certain days. So there's certain tariffs now where it's gone to zero uh, uh, and incentivizing that, that local consumption or conspicuous consumption, right? To say, okay, we're going to try to motivate the change of behavior for these distributed sources. And what, so so what if, we, if, we talk, if we tokenize, the, the, if we tokenize the kilowatt hour, the offset, then we can also tokenize the carbon credit. And that's the other working group that, yeah. we're, that we're starting. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So if we do this, uh, Kai, we could, in a way, create virtual power plants, right? Well, at the end of the day, um, energy communities have always been, for us, at least the subsection of virtual power plants. It's, it's um, you know, looking at the energy markets from first principles. You know, that's where we come from as energy market experts. We, we, un we understand that to, um, you know, to really make rapid decarbonization of our economy happen, we need to have the you know, smart edge devices participating. Smart edge devices, what does it mean? Smart means um, those are devices who are app enabled, right? Like your Tesla, or maybe like your solar inverter, you always have an app for that. And edge means they're connected to the edges of the electricity grid. So really at the households or small medium enterprises. And the fantastic thing is that there are a lot of them out there. The bad thing is, they're not utilized yet, right? So we're talking about 10 billion euro um, invested by European Union household, house, households every month into smart edge devices. Can you think about that? Mm. It's crazy, mm. right? Um, we have 11 million electric vehicles already in the European Union on the streets, 6.5 home charging stations in 2023, already today, mm -hmm. 20 million heat pumps and more than 120 um, HVAC systems or air conditions and stuff like this. This sums up to more than 150 gigawatt of flexibility capacity that is not being utilized at the moment. And why? Because it's not interoperable, right? So what, what does it mean not being interoperable? It means they cannot be connected. Um, software systems like, energy, uh, like, uh, like um, decentralized um, energy resource management systems, they cannot access uh, these assets for them to bring like valuable services to the society, right? And to the markets. So that's, that's what we need to change. And to change that, you need obviously to check certain boxes, right? To be interoperable. And the first thing is the buy-in of the asset owner. Because if you don't have the guy who owns the asset, obviously nothing is happening. And energy communities are the first step to get this buy-in to asset owners. Because now it, we have also a regulatory framework to make it easy for them to uh, to to transact directly. That's yeah, why it's important. Is, you know, under pressure, everything becomes possible. But you know, the regulatory frameworks are changing, Absolutely. and especially if you look at European energy laws. Yeah. But there's also security laws. <laughs> you know, so uh, today we're going to be announcing that we're, as an energy group, we've been selected in the regulatory sandbox. And uh, so, but. It's not just the energy law, right? It's no, also it's, it's the you know, intersection. It, it's the intersection. Right, so that's the yeah. perfect storm. And to get all this done is going to take time. It's uh, the, the technology is the easiest, I think, to solve. And um, uh, how do you see that? Because you're from Australia. You know, you're a continent with what twenty five million people. It should be simple there. You know, you have well, they're actually leading the world. So IEMO have designed a grid that will be totally decentralized. Uh, there's no spinning reserve um, in South Australia. So all of the uh, inverters and wind uh, wow. uh, options yeah. there 
are, are such that uh, there's something called synthetic inertia. So the, the inverters are grid forming. You can do a cold start in the South Australian grid just from batteries and, and renewables. So th this is really um, creating a, 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 what's called a dynamic op operating envelope around each substation. And these um, substation decision trees need, need data. And so we're really looking at, at ways to create new data sets, new datagrams that allow these edge devices to communicate. Um, we think that the protocols need to be designed so they're, they allow some alignment, uh, but they need to be loosely coupled. Yeah. So you can't create a tightly coupled system. It needs to be flexible. We need to bring incentives and other industry players to come in and bring their storage, uh, the energy orchestration of these assets as well and at different voltages. So mid voltage also, you know, there, there's a role to play for the, um, the, the new high voltage or uh, high voltage DC uh, cables that are going to be pulled. So the, the, the real answer is everything all at once. You know, it's a multiverse of, of technology ecosystems are evolving and Australia is really leading the way in, in doing that. We're taking the learning curve from Australia and trying to deploy this thinking in, in piecewise ways into different European frameworks. And Europe leads the world in the adoption cycle of this because of the imperative uh, of, of uh, coming off gas due to Putin. But uh, if, if you look at the market momentum, as Kai was saying, it, we still have this huge opportunity to, to align the resources and the signaling, uh, the grid services, even for the flex market would, would be uh, some, something that we oh, just absolutely. really need to, flex, to really focus on. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Europe, you, you know, this is a guy who's Canadian, Australian. He's you know, stuck in Amsterdam now. We love you for it. But you're telling us that Europe is leading the way. And yeah, the, yeah how? You know, because we have all these different countries, all these different jurisdictions, all these different power grids. Seems to me that should make it more difficult. Yeah, but the uh, the policies are actually uniform. The the uh, the European Union has done its job to create this uniform approach, even though um, there's pushback at the at the edges, and not every jurisdiction has the same level of adoption. Let's say of Germany, um, you know, Portugal and Spain finally will enable these types of local communities as well. So, do you so, see? You know, you're in Austria. So, what do you think are the forerunners in terms of adoptions in Europe? Mm -hmm. The smaller countries, bigger countries, you know, can you shed some light? Well, like looking at the map, we have 13 member states that um, put in place um, on the national level um, laws that, that were coming from the uh, European Union um, Renewable Energy Directive 2, um, basically formulating the umbrella for the, the so-called energy citizens, right? Of which the energy communities are just one part. They're also active consumers and prosumers. And... Um, they're, they're rather smaller countries um, having this put in place. I think another seven, seven, of, seven of them are in draft status. Germany has, is, 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 is nowhere there. So really? they don't have even a draft really? uh, wow. coming from energy communities. Um, but Austria does have, I think, um, Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian countries. I think the Netherlands are also doing a lot of things now. Mm -hmm. um, Italy. Italy, just, yeah. Just released. Uh, well, we were just there in Rome. It was so, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spain, of course, as well. There's a large revival of this uh, after some years of, uh, yeah, where, where they were a little bit going into sleep. In, um, yeah, <laughs> a little bit the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But you know, and you just said it. You know, so sonified with your sensors, you're going to be agnostic to whatever network. But uh, Riddle and Code, you have your own Riddle network. You know, has that been launched yet, or you, you're working oh, on that? Is there anything you can share here? Oh, I'm so excited, Alex. Yeah, I'm really excited. So um, the Riddle network is actually. Um, for, uh, looking at this from a from a high level point uh, from a very high level perspective, it is one of the most exciting topics in crypto at the moment. It's it it belongs to the group of decentralized physical infrastructure networks. It has a very ugly name. It's called DPINs. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but they, they do exciting things. So um, similar uh, to what Helium does for five G routers or LoRaWAN routers or uh, uh, a demo, for example, does with cars, connecting cars. And on a critical note, you know, Worldkind does with human iris scanners. Yeah. Um, 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 the Riddle network um, uses or, or applies token mechanisms to incentivize communities to build physical infrastructure networks from the ground up. In terms of the Riddle network, they go a little bit um, a more universal way. So 
um, they, the infrastructure that they're bringing to the world basically are data loggers that can be plugged in or embedded into any kind of machinery out there. And that's really exciting. Um, testnet is running already. So um, our client solutions are running partly on testnet already. And the mainnet will be launched at the end of the year. Oh, um, wow. And so uh, if, if somebody so should be interested. How many nodes are operating now? I think we have I 17 have nodes now operating. Right. Yeah. And um, um, I think exciting news uh, to come definitely for that. It needs to be very, very clear that this is an open software and hardware foundation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm not a representative of the real network. Um, we just happen to build uh, on top of the Riddle network for some of our applications mm -hmm. uh, as Riddle and Code, right? And, and, and obviously the founder of, uh, of Riddle comes from Riddle and Code, but in the meantime, it is an own foundation. And if, you, if you're interested in this, check out the Discord channel uh, of the Riddle network. Who is uh, the founder of the Riddle network? It's Tom Fürsten. Oh, Tom, okay. Tom okay. Fürsten, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we should have him here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Next, oh, next one. Yeah, absolutely. Need more than half an hour, though. <laughs> well, we'll, 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 we'll put him in a room with Leon. We'll <laughs> yeah, I, two I, had hours. With, I had a call with easily, Tom last easily. week. So, yeah, 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 yeah. We really cross-pollinated some of our thinking. So, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> but the, the smart edge devices, and you know, we are all from the IoT business, uh, yeah. and we were Even your legacy. Yeah, absolutely, so. you know. Um, the, these these edge devices are going to need trust anchors, and these trust anchors can be you know uh, can be chips, can be anything, uh, and it really depends on the appliance, right? So in a solar panel, you want to be you have it be very low cost and very embedded into the fabric of the. What what are you doing to launch those early adopter solar parks now? You need gateways, you need uh, yeah. the secure elements. So we're partnering with uh, gateway providers. So Riddle & Code is one of the gateway providers. There's another company called Bausch Datacom that also make what are called RTUs, rack, rack uh, muxes, uh, that uh, combine signals and uh, uh, provide a, a way to orchestrate the data coming from multiple sensors. So Bausch has been in business, for, I think, for over 30 years uh, doing things at the utility scale um, uh, aggregation of data. Um, they're now stepping into this type of telemetry for uh, blockchain uh, enablement of assets. And so starting with the asset digitization was the, was the first uh, introduction to Bausch. But now we're looking at, at the data streams coming from uh, distributed energy resources, solar being one of them, storage, and then also uh, there'll, there'll be other um, mechanisms in the home, whether it be a heat pump or even solar thermal. So uh, those, all of those appliances need sensors and yeah. they need trust anchors ultimately. And the, the data uh, combination, the, the, the concentration of data really needs this type of trust and orchestration. So we're, we're providing the initial um, datagram standard for this from, from our sensors. We're then um, working cooperatively with Two tokens to say here here's a standard that we can use to make energy more programmable and um, you know uh, Jos Rollins uh, made, made the white paper last year to follow on from the democratization the power of the many to the concepts of programmable energy in web3 terms they call it composability how can you compose a smart contract and have a solar panel as one of the ingredients the offtake from that solar panel being uh, some of the token protocols that you can program against. So programmable energy is a concept that uh, we borrowed from the teleco industries. If you can imagine, copper wire used to be the way that we would communicate, um, and then the copper wire was replaced with voice over IP packets. And those VoIP packets, those voice packets, were programmable. And then we created software-defined energy networking, and we replaced all those copper wires with fiber. And so the, the same thing is going to happen with energy assets. We'll have packetized energy. Those packets of energy will be programmable. Uh, different features will be exp expressed in APIs. And the software orchestration of energy is also uh, a new IEEE standard. So there's uh, standards coming out and emerging on packetized energy, on software-defined energy networking. And we're looking to be an actor in those kinds of discussions, not just working group here in Netherlands with two tokens, but what is the actual infrastructure players 
going to do to, to make this uh, deployable across the world. Yeah, there should be stress, right? So we, we work with ISO, we work with IEEE, Energy Tech, IWA. Yeah. So I think it's important that we come up with standards, but more importantly is that those standards are being used, right? Because Correct. the standard is only as good as the people that use it. Um, talk, speaking of which, you're going to be presenting today the projects that are being rolled out in, in Austria. You know, we're going to hear yes. from other projects. Uh, what do you see as uh, the low-hanging fruit? Well, there's no real low-hanging fruit in terms of you know, democratizing energy. You know, is that uh, energy communities consisting out of citizens? Are these uh, um, maybe big power plants or maybe uh, corporations that want... What, what is your early view on this? Yeah, the gateway drug. You yeah. Want, you, want to, you want to talk about the gateway drug? Well... Um, what we see here is, is, is obviously going um, for for products and services that are like or oriented around like them, you know, uh, those regulatory conditions that make it more easy to, to step in, right? And obviously the Renewable Energy Directive 2 framework <clears throat> around citizen, um, citizen energy communities and, and renewable energy communities provides some of, of these things. And what we found out in, in Austria that um, we have um, two um, basically approaches set into law already. So this renewable energy community, which is basically um, must only consist of renewable energy sources and is um, basically um, um, structured locally. So it uh, can only, uh, only people who are basically registered um, or connected under grid level, a certain grid level five, um, are allowed to build one a renewable energy community, which makes it you know it's 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 very hard to scale in terms of a product and a digital product. So I think the sweet spot really is those citizen energy communities, which are by definition um, they can be much much larger. So they can basically span across one nation, and and I think uh, EU legislation even allows for cross border uh, citizen energy communities. So and energy communities across border oh, okay. as well, as That's, well, as yeah. well. Um, but, but tokens don't have borders, so yeah, it only makes sense. Right. So the uh, tokens should mirror also the physical system at, at yeah. some at some point, and and obviously there are obviously entry exit rules, there are cross border points, and and the grid at the end of the day, in terms of copper, is is anyway uh, connected in the European Union. So that's. That's where we are, and we see that this this framework of citizen energy communities, which is more loose, also in terms of, um, you know, which entities are allowed to partake, right? So also, um, you know, commercial players can be part of, of of those citizen energy communities, which I think we will see much much more developments in this segment uh, in Austria. We also are working heavily on on a solution here together with our clients. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing in terms of adoption? Who are you targeting? Different yeah. audience, I'm so, sure. So our learning curve really still st uh, stems from Australia. We're building a network of uh, participants in solar parks. Uh, so we, we've got partnerships that want to build 5 megawatt solar parks. We see that just under 5 megawatts, these parks are easily put together. Um, there's a real need and imperative. Uh, and these 5 megawatt parks can find capital at a reasonable price. So a 5 megawatt park is about 9,000 solar panels. This hit meets... The, uh, the needs for us to hit a minimum viable, uh, let's call it unit volume for sensors. And we've been able to, uh, to really drive this kind of initiative by bringing this thinking not just to Australia, but we have customers that want sensors in Africa, customers that want sensors in the UK, customers that want this kind of topology uh, at, a, at about a megawatt scale or bigger to, to about five megawatts. So this allows us to get a, a, an order book of sensors to then drive the unit economics and do our first kind of production run. So we've really been looking at the, the bigger size scale so we can, we can drive the unit volume and eventually then play into re the residential and commercial industrial side. Well, it's a classic push-pull. Yeah, you know, we, like, we have to create a push-pull market. But if you, if you were referring to the telecom industry 30 years ago, um, when did that really take off? It took off when modems started to become cheaper when access became cheaper oh right so financial contracts you know i think it was also about the business model and and exactly people offering uh, new ways to buy these things and, uh, and and so the voip industry really didn't kick off until you could buy futures yes. in voip infrastructure capacity and once the financiers were able to say okay we can see a future capability uh you know in the blockchain way this would be um, forward financing hash rates 
or forward financing infrastructure this way. Absolutely. So, so this is the way we see how infrastructure has been financed, whether it be Spectrum. Uh, 5G Spectrum was financed by giving someone a SIM card. And this kind of financial model uh, of, of infrastructure really s- does start to drive the adoption because once you can make a, a park financiable and insurable, then, then uh, the bankers will come. Um, the, once they see that the, the risk has kind of been unbundled and, and quarantined, the, this is the kind of infrastructure model that we're trying to bring. Um, the people that are real stakeholders in the data coming from the solar park is really the insurance companies as well. But, okay, okay, okay. But wait, 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 wait. So in the meantime, you know, when was it? Uh, and, and, and this twenty years ago, the the old vice president of the United States made this 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 presentation and un class and truth. I think it was called that. An inconvenient. Inconvenient truth. truth, right? So you now we're now twenty years into it. The good news is that he told us last uh, uh, last month that the acceleration of the energy transition is going faster than anybody would have thought. So there's a lot more solar panels being deployed. Yeah. Not all- There were some people out there who expected that, <laughs> but not many, you're not right. Not many, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, which tells me that this uh, this change is is happening. It's, it's going faster and faster, but how do we bring tokenization of solar assets and, t- and, and energy to, to the end user, to the consumer, because to them, Yes, this is great that we have this nerdy talk, right? Well, but but, but but how do we yeah, bring it exactly. to the to the consumer? That's the right question, right? That's the right question. It has to be invisible to them in a way. Well, the, it's an app economy that needs to be easy for them to onboard. Well, that was it's Steve Jobs. There's an app for that, but, <laughs> yeah. right? But we don't have that yet. We're well, not there yet. They need to understand it's so valuable, right? So yeah. if we um, if they understand, and I think there are easy ways to explain that nowadays that the cost of ownership can be reduced massively for any of those assets it's so sexy for them because you can buy you know a new tesla sooner you can buy a new charging station you can buy a battery system a solar pv panel if there are like you can you can buy beer with kilowatt hour that's exactly what i'm talking about right so uh, people like at, at least fifty percent uh, of the of the clients. But, of but us, they're one, asking, "What the, do I get out?" But there's of one difference, right? Because yeah. thirty years ago, it's with telco, you know, communications was expensive, right? And uh, we didn't see a phone yeah. as as it's not as, producing exactly. It that, just producing so that, that took some time, money. And yeah. uh, but with energy, it's going to be different. Well, there are cash flows, and then if you own an asset, obviously there is already some productivity that you know uh, you benefit from that right so if i have a solar power plant it produces uh, power and i can you know maybe uh, use less from the grid so it's bare money right but obviously there's so much more value potential when you interconnect those devices with each other right and um, and basically um, create for example um, services like grid flexibility you can aggregate these things into into virtual power plants and um we will, you know, the suc- the main success factor for this to grow and uh, is for me uh, how transparent we can make this value distribution, like also apparent to the asset owner. If yeah. if if I'm really sitting there as a in, in you know in a household, inflation is is you know going through the roofs in many many member states in the EU, especially in Austria. Well, there's a lot, um, there are a lot of energy sexy. cooperatives really cool. out there, and yeah. that number is growing in Europe, and yeah. they could all be virtual power. Right. So uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. If, if I if, if, if this reduces my uh, amortization period yeah. for a solar uh, panel from you know whatever, uh, twelve years to to five years, I'm I'm all in. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. So We see the opportunity to embed finance with the product, so that it, this combination of bringing the financiers and the insurance companies, where you can embed the finance to uh, build out solar for a community and reduce the capex cost exactly. by thirty percent. Exactly. And, and say, if you build the, the solar park for the community, it might be a, a megawatt park around a soccer pitch and a, a, a sort of park area, this would involve uh, a solar finance model. And that solar finance model would, would uh, be embedded uh, uh, and allow this solar infrastructure to be an op- OPEX item rather than just a CAPEX item. And the financialization of these assets will allow this kind of critical uh, you know, on ramp and adoption uh, cycle to accelerate. Well, I think we still have a long journey ahead. You know, the journey only just started, feels like. Um, and with that said, there's one more thing. Uh, what would you like the listeners to give? You know, is there a call to action? 
you know, and there's several types of listeners, right? So, but well, uh, I, I just want to, you know, raise awareness um, about these decentralized uh, physical infrastructure networks out there. This is really exciting. Um, not, not, not only Riddle, right? Um, but go there, riddle.io. You can read the white paper and everything. So, but, but also like, for example, Demo. I just registered like three weeks ago my car at this uh, Demo, um, a Deepin, where you just um, basically at least um, give access to some of the, uh, the data that the car produces uh, to, to such an infrastructure network. And then now service providers can come on top and say, look, um, we can build a car sharing service on, the, on this, or we can help you um, um, maybe save energy or maybe save uh, you know, fuel or whatever, uh, give you some behavior, give you some analytics back. Um, this is exciting. And it's even more exciting if you think about what this is built on, because it's built on trusted data. Yeah. And trusted data might be one of the most important topics going forward when we want to collaborate with artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. So if you want to unleash this powerful thing uh, that artificial intelligence has become, especially in conversational models like um, um, LLMs, um, yeah, LLMs, uh, like ChatGPT, and you want to bring it into the industry, you need this trust. So trust anchors and the de decentralized physical infrastructure networks like Riddle that bring these trust anchors into the world. Those are the exciting things. Um, anybody who is in this kind of nerdy uh, sector, get out and, 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 and look it up. It's, it's really exciting. HID, remember? What's your call to action? Uh, our call to action is, is again, on, on awareness building that this uh, infrastructure is possible. We're looking for uh, people to get active with uh, their own communities. We're, we're looking to work with uh, two tokens to create a field guide so that we can onboard communities. We, we think that there, there should be a, a template that you could repeat yes. in different community contexts. So you could say, here's a field guide for doing this in Australia. We'll, we'll be doing that kind of work uh, for Australia, then mapping that over to how, how would some activists, citizens in a precinct say, how can we bootstrap our own, our own solar infrastructure? Yeah. And a field guide really be, becomes practical when you can say, okay, from this vendor mix, I can then uh, pick and choose sure. and make something happen. So we, we don't want to be on the think tank side. We want to be on the do tank. And a field guide is one of the things that we want to see achievable we need community engagement to make that happen so that that's really why we're here is to engage with that whole ecosystem and uh, to, to make this possible well that's great and with that you know i'd like to thank you both i look forward to hearing your keynotes later and so basically what i hear you both say is join us and come forward step forward with your projects and let's just do it yes yeah. huh? and come see us in uh, paris end of november you can find us online, and if you want to join this working group, you're a co-captain, you're a co-captain, you know, uh, let's do it. Thank you. Fantastic. Right. Thank Thanks, you. Alex. Good. Ciao. That was it for today's podcast. Thank you for listening in, and please subscribe so you don't miss out on our upcoming episodes. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find our contact details at www.twotokens.org.